The year is 2017. A young boy, who is also known by his gamer name, <laughs> Atomic, finally decided to purchase this hip new gaming console that would supposedly allow him to play AAA titles and take a shit at the same time. Yeah, I'm about to drop a deuce and uh, I ain't talking about Mario Tennis, you know what I'm saying? At the time I purchased my Switch, I could choose from three games to get together with it, but having already played Breath of the Wild on my Wii U, I basically only had two choices. And since I was feeling pretty adventurous that day, I decided to try out this cool new JRPG that everyone seemed to be losing their minds over called Xenoblade Chronicles. 2. I would then begin to regret that decision <laughs> about three hours later. That being said, I still ended up liking the game enough to want to finish it, and at the time I'm making this video, I've actually played through the game twice. And while I am glad that I gave it the chance it deserved, I still ended up being a little bit disappointed. But I want to make it clear that I'm not making this video just to complain and shit on something that people like. Instead, I want it to be more of like a friendly discussion that people can think about and enjoy whether or not they're fans of the game. Because at the end of the day, this is all just my opinion, and I'm not some kind of renowned critic or reviewer. I'm really just an insane person who not a lot of people like to talk to. I will admit that the main reason I decided to make this video is because hearing people talk about this game often gives me a migraine, but it is my hope that by the end of this video, you will at least understand a little bit why I think that in spite of it being a technical marvel on the Switch with an absolutely stellar soundtrack and brilliant diversity for build customization, Xenoblade 2 still has many flaws that can be huge deal breakers for a lot of new players. Now before we dive into this video, it's important to note that I have not played the first game or the DLC, so I won't really be bringing these two things up as comparisons and will instead be looking at the game as more of a standalone experience rather than as a sequel. So now that all that shit's out of the way, let's start by talking about the combat. The combat of Xenoblade 2 is very polarizing in a sense that most people will either fall into the category of Life itself was inspired by the combat of Xenoblade 2 or My wife left me and I am now homeless because of Xenoblade 2's combat And as a former member of, <laughs> of this side uh, I wish to offer some insights on why people might think this way. Many people who don't like the combat will say stuff like it's too slow and it's boring and although these can be valid criticisms, a good number of these people haven't actually finished the game and seen everything the battle system has to offer. Now, while it is irresponsible to criticize something without fully understanding how it works, in this particular case, can you really blame them? Because it's kind of also the game's fault for making the player wait 10 hours and play through like 3 chapters before actually giving them full access to all the features of the battle system, which is also when the combat tends to really pick up for a lot of people. Though it can definitely feel rewarding to learn a system that's as complex as the one in Xenoblade 2, the reason why more people will get turned off by this game specifically is because in most other games that have a lot of things to learn and pay attention to during combat, the game lets the player learn these things through gameplay. Not a bunch of fucking text boxes that pop up every 10 minutes at the beginning of the game. You know, some people like me just want to have fun and press buttons and see moving pictures on the screen. Like, I don't want to fucking read, dude. Like, get these fucking words out of here. The too long didn't wipe my ass summary of this section is basically that the game's battle system is at its best when it begins to allow the player to be creative and diverse in how they can optimize their damage through the customization of their builds, but at its worst can feel repetitive and tedious because it does very little to actively engage and challenge the player during the actual combat itself. Now for the three people here who watched my video about 2020's Game of the Year, you will probably recall that when I criticized Final Fantasy VII Remake's combat system, I talked about two things that I think any combat system should choose between to have as its main focus, which are essentially challenging the player to be able to press buttons real good and master the controls through more action-focused gameplay, or placing a bigger focus on strategy and challenging the player mentally with a more stat-based system. But unlike Final Fantasy VII Remake, which had the problem of not being able to decide which of these two aspects I just mentioned is more important, my issue with Xenoblade 2 is more so 
a lack of these two elements. The battle system of Xenoblade 2 can be roughly broken down into a flowchart because of how the mechanics kind of lead into one another. For the first part of this chapter, I am mainly going to be talking about these things, but I'll talk more about the others later, so don't worry. So to begin, I want to highlight a similarity between Xenoblade 2 and another very popular game you may have heard of called League of Legends. Okay, I know, I know, just... Just, just hear me out. For those of you who don't know, every playable champion in League of Legends has the ability to auto-attack, which is a basic targeted attack on any enemy creep or champion that automatically triggers every set interval. Once an auto-attack animation is completed, the attack will go through and the hit will register on the target no matter what. Over and above this, all champions have a passive, three regular abilities as well as an ultimate ability which is usually stronger and has a longer cooldown. Does this all sound familiar to you yet? Now I want to compare two particular abilities in the game which are Rise's Overload and Annie's Disintegrate. These two abilities are similar in the sense that they are both projectiles that do damage but have one key difference which is that Overload requires you to physically aim with your mouse where Rise will fire it while Disintegrate just requires you to click on your target and Annie will kind of automatically shoot at the person that you clicked on for you. If we were to compare a mirror match between two Rises just using Overload and a mirror match between two Annies just using Disintegrate, then on a surface level, it might seem that the interaction between the two Rises is a lot more interesting because it is. In the Rise Ditto, the two players are able to play around each other's abilities using their movement and attempt to dodge their opponent's projectile while trying to aim their own. Compare this to the two Annies, where sure, they can still move around during combat, but it is essentially as good as them just standing still, because once their opponent's projectile comes out, there is no way for them to avoid getting hit by it. So the two Annies can kind of just stand around. <laughs> Kind of like the teammates you get in this game. What I'm trying to get you to see is that in Xenoblade 2, by having all attacks and abilities be auto-targeted like Annie's Disintegrate, if we were to look at the combat from a more action-focused, dynamic standpoint, then they have already kind of shot themselves in the foot. One major complaint people have about this game, especially during the first few hours, is that there are a lot of intervals during combat where the player is essentially just standing around and auto-attacking and doing nothing, which could have been avoided by having more interaction between the gamer and the game. Going back to the whole Rise and Annie example, in Xenoblade 2, just like the Annie Ditto, you can move around all you want during combat to position yourself to use your arts, but there's nothing you can do in terms of movement to avoid getting hit, and the enemies also can't really force you out of standing at a certain position. To actually dodge an attack, an evasion stat check must be passed, which will cause the attack to count as a miss, and Rex to go, Ah! I missed! <laughs> Fuck. Whereas if we were to look at the Rise Ditto, if I, as one of the Rises, is aware that, let's say, the other Rise is trying to hit me from my left, I can intentionally fire my Overload towards that direction to punish him for moving there, and he can respond to this by sacrificing that positioning to avoid taking damage from my projectile, or continue moving towards that direction and sacrifice a little bit of health. But because Xenoblade 2 chose to go with the baby-ass Annie Ditto, it misses out on these interactions and decisions, which would have made for a much more interesting and fun experience. Experience. The whole aggro system is also a very double-edged sword in my opinion, because while it allows you to make sure that your tanks are doing their job, it also means that if you're playing as the character that isn't taking aggro, you can basically move around the enemy and get the bonus damage from your arts for free. The point I'm trying to get across is that, for some reason, even though the game is encouraging the player to move around in combat through the use of arts, it doesn't do anything to make it fun or interesting to do so which results in the movement in the game being as good as a menu with options that you can just select to move to a certain position. With one exception. This fucking goat is hands down the best enemy in the entire game. You wanna know why? Because Billy here has a kick move that hits anyone behind him even if they aren't aggroed and actually forces you to think twice before you go and stand behind him. And this is what I'm talking about. Every enemy in this game should strive to be this GOAT. But apart from all that auto-targeted League of Legends shit, the biggest question I have about the combat of this game is that if they were going to choose not to make the system turn-based and allow the player to move around freely in an open space instead of restricting them to a menu, then why not make just a little bit more use of the fact that the character models have fucking legs? With the exception of a small minority, most enemies in this game, including bosses, just run up to the character they're aggroed onto and attack while standing still. 
Even Chrono triggers enemies. Move around during combat and make it harder for you to use certain abilities effectively. And that game came out in 1995. Like, really think about that for a second. It just seems like a real missed opportunity to me, because there are a shit ton of enemies in this game, and they could have all had different movement patterns and abilities that hit certain areas around them, which would not only fix the problem of non-aggroed characters being able to position for free, but also make it so that you have to, like, actually play the game and move the control stick instead of standing around most of the time. Talking a little bit about the aggro system, having battles be integrated with the open world and not in a separate instance is a pretty cool idea on paper. What ends up actually happening is one, more people keep aggroing and joining the fight which makes it go on forever, or two, some stupid overleveled enemy in the area randomly joins and just ruins everything, and <laughs> I haven't even touched on this yet. There's nothing inherently wrong with placing stronger enemies in early areas for the player to come back to fight once they are stronger, but if I had to use one word to describe why this is so much more frustrating in Xenoblade 2, it would be counterplay or lack of counterplay. If you're gonna allow the player to encounter strong enemies before reaching the recommended level for fighting them, then you have to make it so that there is a reliable and clear way for the player to avoid these enemies so that if they happen to die because of them, then the player would be able to recognize that it was their fault. You also get bonus points if the player is able to defeat said enemy through good skill expression, but I digress. In Xenoblade 2, not only can a random off-screen gorilla or bird aggro onto you, it is also, like, harder to run away from an encounter in this game than it is to get a degree in medicine. This also ties back to all the auto-targeted shit I spent like a million years just talking about. There is no way for you to play around an auto-attack from a monster that is nearly 80 levels higher than you, which is almost certainly going to instantly kill you. Chapter 3 is like one of my least favorite parts of the entire 60-hour game because the pacing just slows down to like a snail and all the problems with the combat start to become very apparent. At the beginning of the chapter, Rex just completely forgets about going to Elysium, which, <laughs> by the way, the game literally establishes as the primary objective right before the chapter starts. Um, yeah, we're gonna have everyone forget about that for an hour so that we can introduce Van Hum and have him deliver a bunch of exposition and then try to develop his character so that we can just immediately kill him off. Okay, he's he's actually a pretty cool character, like, I'm sorry, Van Hum. Okay, but there's this part where you have to try travel across this huge area to get to the next town, and in both my playthroughs, the trip there just felt like a huge slog because of the combat. Like, I specifically made sure to upgrade all my equipment and shit, but you still get into so many fights that are like three to four minutes long and you just stare at your screen and do a quick time event every now and then. Towards the end of the era on my second playthrough, I actually had this fight that lasted like 10 minutes because I didn't have a blade that could seal reinforcements, so more and more people just kept joining the fight. Just as a comparison, a standard fight against regular enemies in Dragon Quest XI usually doesn't take more than like two minutes. If you're gonna have these long ass drawn out fights, then you gotta keep me engrossed with some kind of action so it doesn't get stale, which I unfortunately feel that Xenoblade 2 doesn't do for reasons I just spent the entire chapter up till this point explaining. The action in this game's combat essentially boils down to you move a little bit to position yourself around an enemy, then you watch your character auto-attack until you get your arts, then you press a button, and then after you press enough buttons, you do a quick time event, and then you, you do, do it, it all, all over, over again. again. Which isn't nearly as fun as some of the other ARPGs that fully commit to having more action-packed combat. Okay, so having said all that, if Xenoblade 2's combat doesn't really do much in the field of challenging the player mechanically, what then does it do to challenge the player mentally? It actually does some stuff pretty well. I mentioned at the beginning of the chapter that the biggest strength of the battle system is the freedom the game gives you to customize your party, and I'm gonna elaborate a bit more on what I mean by this. Assuming you have a good number of blades on each character, you can actually have anyone fill any role in combat, which can be tank, healer, or DPS, which <laughs> I just realized how similar that is to Overwatch. <laughs> anyway, 
Couple this with the fact that each blade has a different element and weapon, and that each driver has a different moveset for each weapon type, there are a shit ton of ways to build your party. And coming up with ways to make your characters synergize with each other to do the most damage in battle is one of the most fun things in Xenoblade 2 that I don't think any other RPG I've played does better. This is what I feel the game does best in terms of strategy, because while building your party, there are a lot of things to think about. Like for example, what elements you want to use for blade combos, or if you want to include any driver combos in your setup, and who the one taking aggro will be, and if that character is taking aggro, then does he or she have moves that hit harder from the front, that sort of thing. But one crucial thing that I feel this game forgot to do is that there is a surprising lack of variation in strategy when it comes to dealing with any encounter. In the beginning of this chapter, I showed a flowchart to represent how every mechanic in the battle system kind of leads into another, but because the combat is structured in this way, every fight ends up boiling down to the same pattern. You auto-attack to build arts, you use arts to build specials, then you chain the specials to generate orbs, and then you use your chain attack. Every fight plays out the same way, and you don't really make any interesting decisions because you're always following this same flowchart to do damage. Apart from maybe some enemies that call for reinforcements, you almost never need to adapt to the enemy's abilities because of the way the debuffs in this game were designed. Like look at his boss fight against Dougal for example. His blade is able to do a move that does blowdown, which I'm guessing the game wants me to see and go, oh shit, okay, he, he does blowdown, so, so I should try to seal blowdown with a win combo, right? But whether or not you choose to seal it, the fight will still play out the same way. If I choose to seal it right away, then because of the orb system, Dougal will have resistance to the win element, and I'll be forced to end my next blade combo with another element which will then unseal blowdown and allow him to do it again. If I choose not to seal it at all and just throw a random element at him for damage, Sure, maybe I'll have to deal with getting interrupted for a few seconds every now and then, but it isn't enough to stop me from just wailing on him with more blade combos. The end goal of both approaches still defaults back to do as many blade combos as possible for the most damage. The point is that no debuff or ability in the game can really jeopardize this same strategy of stacking 4 orbs then chain attacking into a full burst in any way, and are usually just minor annoyances that you can ignore, which makes the whole ceiling mechanic kind of pointless. I can only really count one time where I actually had to care about what to seal, which was against the final boss of the game, which will overwhelm you with reinforcements if you don't seal it. Driver combos are also nice ways to debilitate your enemy and do more damage if you can include them in your party setup, but aren't very interesting to pull off because they always follow this same path and aren't necessary for any fight either. The same can be also said about fusion combos, I feel like they're just there as like a thing that you can do. Many other RPGs with strategic combat have similar strengths to Xenoblade 2 when it comes to building a party, but push the player further by forcing them to adapt to situations and enemies that they have to change their approach against either during combat or by tweaking their builds. Bravely Second not only has a shit ton of classes for your party members to choose from, its brave and default battle system, which basically lets you store your turns to use later on, also allows you to vary your approach towards different fights. A lot of bosses in the game will also challenge you to change up your character's jobs and abilities and come up with a new plan and skill rotation that can help you get through the fight. There's a particular boss in the game called the Revenant who possesses other characters and can be a huge bitch to deal with because you can't damage him while he's possessing someone, but through the use of the Exorcist class which allows you to revert a character's HP to its value on the previous turn, if you just kill the possessed person and force the revenant out of their body, you can actually revert the revenant's HP to zero, because on the turn he is forced out of a body, the game will briefly consider him to be dead. Pretty cool, right? Divinity Original Sin 2 is one of my favorite western RPGs ever, because Apart from having decent build creation, its combat is also extremely enjoyable because no battle plays out the exact same way due to the terrain and positioning of enemies. And there are also a shit ton of ways for you to be creative and approach the encounters in different ways, even though your party's build isn't as easy to modify on the spot. Like just as a brief example here, with this same build, I could choose to start this fight by sending my thief in to backstab someone to get some extra damage before starting the encounter, or I could summon an imp in the middle of everyone and <laughs> kinda use him as a meat shield so that my party can come in and clean up safely. The key takeaway here is that for a strategy based combat system to reach its full potential, these two elements of party building and adaptation during combat 
need to work in tandem to create a system that is consistently enjoyable and challenging enough to keep things from becoming stale, and the lack of decision making or freedom or adaptation during actual fights is what really bogs down Xenoblade 2's combat in terms of strategy. To conclude this chapter, I don't think Xenoblade 2's combat is bad by any means, and I can definitely see why fans would find it enjoyable, but I also feel that many people tend to mistake its complexity for depth. But even so, I really started to appreciate the combat a lot more after finishing the game because it actually does feel a lot more fun and rewarding towards the end when it allows you to use your arts much more frequently and change your combos quicker. And pulling off the combos that you plan for your party to execute in battle and seeing every mechanic in the combat system finally fall into place and come together is like a fucking dream come true. It can be really satisfying. But by trying to take so many ideas from both action and strategy, Neither side was able to really reach its full potential and the game ultimately ends up not being nearly as fun as its peers that chose to focus on one side. I'm going to try not to be too harsh when it comes to the story of this game and the reason for this is because the general consensus seems to already be that <laughs> it's not very good. But at the same time, this is an RPG, which uh, my Englando may not be super good, but I think stands for role-playing game. RPGs are one of the genres of video games where the story and characters are at the forefront, which is why, in spite of everything I just said, I think it's still important to look at what Xenoblade 2 has to offer in terms of its story. So to save all you wonderful people the trouble of googling and re-watching scenes from the game, I will now attempt to retell the events of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 as quickly and concisely as possible. God help me. Okay, so the game is set in a world called Alrest, which is kind of like Earth, but the ocean is made out of clouds instead of water, and the countries are all giant floating turtles that people live on called Titans. There is also a world tree in the middle of everything that apparently leads up to this place called Elysium, which is like heaven, and apparently everyone used to live there, and God just kicked them out for some reason. Also, the Titans are all dying, and the sea level is rising, so things aren't looking too good. Also, 500 years ago, there was this guy who climbed the tree and stole these two core crystals, and then he activated one of them, which started like a whole war between the two blades of the core crystals which are called Aegises and shit now I have to explain what blades are. Blades are basically these creatures or people that are born when someone activates their core crystal and a, a bunch of and the people that awaken them is called their driver. There's a bunch of other shit about them like if their driver dies they return to their core and lose all their memory which is it's pretty much the only important thing you need to know. Uh, the game doesn't actually tell you all this until a bit later on but I think it's better to just get it out of the way so that I don't have to explain it later. You play as Rex, a young salvager who dives into the ocean to find valuable stuff to sell and Rex lives on his grandfather who's not actually his grandfather because he's He's a titan, but he calls him Gramps. So one day the chairman of the trade guild that Rex works at hits him up and goes like, Hey dude, I heard you're pretty good at salvaging. How about I pay you a hundred thousand bucks to go on this extremely shady job that you will also literally know nothing about? And Rex is like, Okay. So you go on a mission with these three characters, Jin, Malice, and Nia, and explore this big ass ancient submarine together. And there's this door with a weird symbol on it. And then Jin's like, Open that door. And Rex is like, Oh, oh hell no, nah, I don't know. Everyone's open that goddamn door. So you open the door and ta-da, it's one of the Aegises from the war 500 years ago. So obviously Rex is like, Whoa, what the hell is this? And Malice is like, Don't touch that sword kid don't you fucking touch that sword huh? so Jin fucking kills his ass and there's like no blood for some reason Rex then wakes up in the title screen of the game and he's like what the heck why are we in the title screen Pyra uh, this is Pyra by the way and Pyra's like I want to go home to Elysium and also you're dead so Rex agrees to take Pyra to Elysium and Pyra gives Rex half of her life force so Rex comes back from the dead and he bursts off the submarine and fights Malos but then he gets beaten up and then Pyra gets blasted in the back and then Nia's like what the hell you're just beating up a little kid and he tries to defend you but then she also gets blasted in the face this is still chapter one, by the way. And then Grandpa shows up and saves them, but he gets shot and crash lands onto a titan called Gormont. So now Grandpa is dying, and Rex is like, it's gonna be okay, Grandpa, you know, I got some herbs with me. And Grandpa's like, listen, Rex, I'm not a doctor, but can you see there are literally three harpoons 
piercing into my neck. I don't think your herbs are gonna save my life. So they do a fake out death for grandpa and he becomes small, like, okay, whatever. Rex then finds Nia, who also crash landed nearby and she agrees to help him get to Torgoth, which is the main city in Gormont. But uh-oh, upon reaching town, Nia gets arrested by the Ardanian Empire because the people you were working with on that job at the start of the game are actually terrorists. What the heck? So now you gotta go rescue Nia because even though she's a terrorist, she's like kind of your friend because she helped you and in the process, piss off every member of the Empire in Torgoth and infiltrate their battleship. You'll also meet Tora, who agrees to help you find Nia, and also has a sex robot. So Rex and Tora break Nia out of the battleship and encounter Morag, who is basically the Ardanian Emperor's right-hand woman, who is more important later on, so just remember what she looks like. Rex and the party manage to barely escape, and Rex kind of sits everyone down and goes, listen, the Titans are dying, and people are gonna go to war over land, so we gotta find Elysium and protect Pyra, because people are gonna try to use her as a weapon, and I need your help. And everyone just kind of says, okay, for no, they don't really explain why. So after acquiring a ship, the party sets sail towards the World Tree, but uh-oh, Giant Snake blocks the way so they try to turn back but get swallowed by the Urian Titan, which is like another country. After escaping from the Titan's belly, the party meets this big dude named Vandom who is a really cool guy who saves war orphans. So after doing a bunch of irrelevant shit, Vandom agrees to bring you to his friend in the Urian capital who apparently knows how to get past Big Snake. Before you leave for the capital, you fight Akos who is part of the terrorist group that Jin and Malos are in called Torna. And okay, honestly, you don't have to care about that part. Like everyone in Torna besides Jin and Malos are not important at all. So now we're gonna go all the way across the entire country to meet Vandom's friend, Dark Sidious, who is like the dark side of the force. Anyway, Darth Sid's granddaughter gets kidnapped by Malice and Akos, and the party gets their ass beat, and also Vandom gets killed. So now we're really fucked, like, oh man, like, how are we gonna get out of this one, right? Well, it turns out, uh, Pyra is going to quite literally go Super Saiyan and force Malice and Echoes to retreat. After everything settles down, there's like a shit ton of exposition and turns out Pyra's Super Saiyan form is actually another person named Mithra who was like her original form that fought in the war against the other Aegis who was actually Malos 500 years ago. You also find out that Torna and Malos have the same goal which is to destroy everyone and everything and then climb the world tree and then kill God. So now we gotta go find that guy who climbed the world tree and Dark Sid is like, Now you will experience the full power of the dark side. Uh, also, you gotta go to Indol now. So the party goes through more Ardain, which is the home of the Empire, and helps Morag with an investigation involving Tora's father, and she decides to tag along with them to go to Indol. You also pick up Zeke, who is like this guy who keeps randomly harassing you throughout the game, but he's not actually like a bad guy because he's kind of a goofball, but he works for the people in Indol, so he goes along with you as well. Okay, good. We're already in Indol. So you meet Amalthus, who was the guy who climbed the world tree 500 years ago, and some shit happens. Jin tries to start a fucking war between Mor Ardain and Uriah, so you put a stop to that, and and after that, Amalthus is like, okay, now you gotta go to Tantal because the thing you need to control Big Snake is over there. Also, Morag decides to stick around with you because after seeing everything, she's like, yeah, actually, these guys are pretty cool and, you know, they saved the Emperor's life, so, you know. Okay, so now the party is in Tantal, which is Zeke's homeland that he got kicked out of, uh, and also he's the prince, I forgot to mention that, and, and they, so they go meet the king of Tantal, but uh-oh, the king is kind of a cuckoo, you know, a little, little bit cuckoo crazy, so, and he decides that it's much easier to just destroy Pyra and Mithra and be done with everything, so now you gotta break out of jail and beat up everyone in the kingdom to save Pyra, but uh oh, the giant laser beam they were gonna use to kill her is actually the thing that lets them control the titan that they're living on. So now you gotta go all the way to the titan's head to fix the Omega Fetter, which is also the thing that will let you get past Big Snake. But ding dong, it's Torna and they're here for the Omega Fetter too, so Jin beats everyone up and takes Pyra and the Omega Fetter away. So now we're really fucked, like we literally traveled across the entire world and basically accomplished nothing. And Rex is like, I wanna go home, and everyone's like, dude, Shut the fuck up. Anyway, the king talks to you again and he tells you there's actually a special Aegis sword that was sealed away somewhere by Adam, who was the hero who used Mithra in the war 500 years ago. So now you're gonna shimmy on over and grab that real quick and then head on over to Moritha, where Pyra is being held. So you beat up Malice and Jin with your newfound power, but uh oh, Big Snake and Mithra's Gundam start fighting and destroy the whole place and you fall deep into the cloud sea into the land of Moritha. And hey, 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 look who it is, it's Jin. So since you guys are both fucked, Rex decides to work together with him temporarily and he also tells you some shit about how Amalthus is a piece of shit that ruined his life and that the real reason he climbed the world tree was to become God. Okay, anyway, Jin gets rescued by his Torna friends, leaving Rex and the party to climb the world tree through this conveniently placed entrance. Meanwhile, Amalthus is like, yeah, I actually feel like being a bad guy now. So he fucking declares war on everyone and starts flying towards the world tree. He also has this big tower thing that lets him control other blades and titans using a core crystal that he implanted in his head. Okay, so anyway, Amalthus is a bad guy now and he wants to kill everyone, including Rex, and become God. And like, he had this plan 
to use Rex to defeat Torna or some shit. I don't even fucking know why he just didn't just kill Rex to begin with. His plan makes no fucking sense. Anyway, you continue to make your way up the tree. You run into Jin. You beat him up one last time. Amalthus pops in afterwards looking like the fucking juggernaut. So you beat him up too and Jin decides to believe in Rex and sacrifices himself to defeat Amalthus. So after that, Rex heads up some more and finds Elysium, which turns out to be a piece of shit and nothing like the paradise he thought it was. And he starts hallucinating about everyone in the party getting mad at him for dragging them all the way to this hellhole for nothing. Uh, and then he meets God or the architect who turns out to be a human named Klaus who destroyed Earth by accident a long time ago and created Elris to try and atone for it but eventually gave up on it because he lost faith in mankind but after seeing Rex and his party's actions through Pyra's memory he decides that you know the world's not that bad, right? Also, he's about to die because he's he's got split in half and then he's like Xenoblade 1, the bad guy, and the Shulk killed him. Okay, whatever. So now it's time for the final fight against Malos, who is trying to use this giant robot called Ion to destroy the world. So you beat him up, and then Rex talks to him and finally breaks him free from Amalthus' influence before he dies. Okay, but now Klaus is dead and nothing is holding the world tree together anymore, so it's gonna fall into the atmosphere and destroy everything, and the only way to save everyone is for Pyra to stay behind and use Ion to blow the whole thing up. So, you know, there's this really sad scene like she tricks everyone into escaping without her and then Rex gets really sad because he loves her So everyone except Pyra gets into the escape pod and they leave her behind to destroy the world tree while they go back down to Elrest And once the party comes back they see that the cloud sea is gone and that the titans are all joining together to make this new big continent Which was what Klaus did to save Elrest right before he died and then everyone's like oh yeah You know I guess Elysium was here the whole time and then the credits roll and <sighs> And then after the credits, the Pyra and Mithra come back because uh, the core crystal gave Rex the, like their inside. So they... okay, the end. So yeah, <laughs> I hope you got all of that because that's at least 14 hours of cutscenes condensed into 10 minutes. All in all, I feel that although it takes a while to pick up, the story is actually fairly interesting towards the second half where shit starts getting more real. But at the same time, when it attempts to be more thought-provoking, it feels flimsy and weak because the game never really commits to any of the themes it suddenly tries to present later on. The game tries really hard to paint the idea that Torna and Amalthus are both products of the world they lived in, with all the discrimination and violence they witnessed in the past shaping them into the vengeful, self-righteous and bitter individuals you see in the game, which is also kind of related to one of the main questions the game wants to ask, like, is it really worth it to go through all this shit just to save this unfair and flawed world. But the reason why this doesn't have much impact at all is because you never really see any people doing very terrible or fucked up things or discriminating against blades besides Torna and Amalthus themselves. You never encounter an actual blade that's being mistreated or abused by a human and everyone else you meet is actually a pretty decent person. Even the crazy king that tried to kill Pyra believes he's doing it because it will save the world. The Emperor of Mor Ardain is shown multiple times to be a selfless and caring ruler who wants to avoid war as much as possible. Hell, even Amalthus is never shown to be mistreating or abusing his blade even though he's shown to be racist later on. The only fucking bad person you meet is Banna, who I haven't even mentioned until now if that's a good indication of how much he matters in the story. The game never lets you witness firsthand any of the problems that Torna and Amalthus seem to think the world has, and you only really get to see that shit happen in their flashbacks, which are from 500 years ago. But at the same time, this does kind of work with the development of a few characters like Jin, Malos, Amalthus, and even Klaus, because one common underlying belief that they all share is that the world is destined to die as long as humans exist because they will never change and continue to be these selfish and disgusting creatures which Jin finally broke free from after repeatedly witnessing Rex's determination to fight for the people he loves and Amalthus and Malos who realized that not all humans are bad right before dying and Klaus who after talking to Rex and his party finally came to the conclusion that creating Elrest wasn't for nothing and that he could finally atone for his mistakes. I also want to acknowledge that the final scene where Rex has to leave Pyro slash Mithra behind was also very powerful because the game actually earns this moment with all the interactions and development it actually gave to the relationship between these two characters. But apart from these moments at the end, everything else kind of falls apart. 
Nia has this whole arc where she finally works up the courage to tell the party that she's a blade, but like, why is she even hiding this fact in the first place? The party's not racist against their blades, even in fact they treat them pretty nicely. But the worst part about this is the game doesn't even know why Nia is trying to hide that she's a blade. And there are so many other moments like this where shit just happens and the game doesn't even really know how to explain why it's happening. You can't expect the player to take these moments seriously if they're not even going to take themselves seriously. Setting aside all that shit about the narrative for a while, one common reason some people might dislike not just this game but JRPGs in general is because there is a lot of downtime where you are watching a movie instead of playing a video game. On one hand, almost every action sequence in this game is really well animated and together with the music they're usually quite fun to watch, but on the other hand, they also drag out a lot of scenes where people are just talking or not doing anything interesting and have them play back to back which tends to fuck up the game's pacing a lot. Let's look at this part in chapter 2. After Bridget's boss fight, you watch a cutscene of Nia getting captured and then you watch another one introducing you to Tora. This all adds up to around 4 minutes, which is not so bad considering we just finished the boss fight, right? But then after this, the game lets you control Rex for 10 seconds and then immediately throws you into another cutscene to establish Dougal, who <laughs> does not matter in the story at all, and then another cutscene to show Morag's arrival, and then we go back to another scene of Rex and Tora talking. Okay, it's been 10 minutes, can I play the game? now. But we're not done yet, we're gonna let you control Rex for another 10 seconds and then oops, game time's up kids, don't you want to watch another cutscene of everyone eating and talking? And look, just in case you missed her, we're gonna go back to Morag again, look, she's meeting Dougal, and now look, she's interrogating Nia, oh no, she's in trouble, if only you weren't stuck in this fucking cutscene so you could do something about this. By the time you actually get to play again, it's been like 16 minutes, and just for comparison, this is longer than an episode of Spongebob. I'm sure some writer at Monolith thought that this joke about the guy not knowing what color emerald is was the funniest thing ever, but can we maybe speed it up like just a little bit or maybe put some gameplay in between because I don't mind having cutscenes to advance the story, but I also want to play the video game and for moments like this that aren't even very important or climactic, you really don't need to spend so much time. There are so many scenes and lines that could have just been omitted because they feel like a waste of the player's time, like when Rock's core crystal gets stolen before the trip to Mor Ardain, that shit has no significance in the story at all and it's just there to make the game longer. I kind of want to touch on the voice acting for a while because I think it's also a little bit of a controversial thing. There are many Japanese games out there that were originally voiced in Japanese that have pretty good English dubs that are able to portray the characters in a slightly different way that feels more natural for Western audiences while staying true enough to the characters themselves. And uh, this game is not one of them. I'm sorry if I sound mean because I know it's not easy to be an actor, but having played through once in Japanese and once in English, a lot of serious moments are kind of ruined for me in the English dub when a character makes some silly noise that completely Stay breaks down. my immersion. But... The chemistry between the cast, especially Rex and Pyra, is a bit better in the Japanese dub as well in my opinion, although I guess that's kind of subjective. The way the game handles its characters is quite heavy-handed sometimes, like it's pretty obvious what it's trying to do with Jin in the beginning where it's like, wow, you know, look at this flashback of him saying that he hates fighting, you know, who would have thought that even though you're fighting him now, he's actually kind of a nice guy. Amalthus suddenly turning out to be a bad person was also like out of nowhere, and like I mentioned before, his plan made no fucking sense considering how powerful he already is. Every time a nopon opens their mouth, I want to beat myself with a stick. But at the same time, I actually do genuinely like some characters like Van Hem and Malos, not just because they have the best English performances in my opinion, but also because Van Hem has that whole teacher slash mentor vibe that the game actually pulled off quite well, and Malos, you know, despite being an evil shithead, has some pretty funny lines and is likable as a villain because of his charisma. What the hell? Has he finally cracked? If you look past all the dumb and unnecessary shit that plagues it, there's actually a pretty decent story to be found in this game. Even though it's pretty linear and not very deep, it's still interesting to learn about Alrest and its lore and follow these characters on this crazy ass journey across the world. I think that if you're willing to suspend your disbelief and take the story a lot less seriously, you'll probably still like it even with all the shit I just whined about. But it's also important to acknowledge that the long ass cutscenes and pacing issues really take away from the overall experience when playing the game.
This last chapter is kind of a lightning round of stuff that I want to bring up, but I won't really go into as much detail for each thing as I did in the previous two chapters because I feel like it's not really required. The first thing I want to talk about that some people also complain about is the field skills in the game, which are basically these passive abilities that blades have that are used to pass checks when interacting with specific objects in the overworld. Some people seem to not like this feature because it kind of gatekeeps you from exploring the world for pretty much no reason, which is a pretty valid complaint but I actually think it's fine to make it harder to access some of the optional content in the world. What I do have beef with is when the stuff they lock behind the field skills isn't exactly optional. Oh hey partner, you wanna continue with the main quest? Uh, hell yeah man, sure. Just have Poppy read these here barrels with her level 3 Nopon wisdom. Oh, you don't have that unlocked? Easy, just go talk to 40 Nopons. Oh, what's that? You don't wanna do that because it's kinda pointless and boring? No problem, buddy. Fortunately for you, we thought of that. So you can also proceed with this mission by waiting 30 minutes for a mobile game dispatch mission, which by the way, will also make you watch the affinity charts of each individual blade unlocked one by one and also by the way we're gonna put you through similar dumb shit multiple times throughout the main story just to touch more on the talk to 40 nopons thing I just mentioned getting the player to care about interacting with NPCs can be considered crucial in an RPG because if the player is interested in the people and the characters around them then they can further immerse themselves into the world of the game but if you want me to care about the NPCs in the world then why not just motivate me to do it through actual gameplay instead of <laughs> some fucking dumb shit that just straight up requires me to talk to a nopon 40 times. In Skyrim, the game motivates you to talk to NPCs because they might potentially have a quest for you or because the game makes you take interest in them through various scripted events. For example, you can see the companions killing a giant outside Whiterun and you hear people in Whiterun talking about them which might make you as a player curious about joining them and actively look for them to find out how. Which is a hell of a lot better than and the game just saying, Hey, go talk to 50 NPCs in Whiterun because we said so. I get that this is a weird complaint and that many other RPGs do this as well, but in Xenoblade 2, you already have almost every NPC that's worth talking to already marked out on your map for you. And everyone else kind of just says some dumb shit like, Necromancy may be legal in Cyrodiil, but, but few will openly admit, admit to practicing it now that the Mage's Guild has banned it. it. Although the story and the setting of the game can drastically influence this as well, I actually find myself proactively exploring towns and talking to NPCs more when none of the important ones are marked out for me. Even in a baby-ass game like Pokemon, the game doesn't give you any clue as to which NPC is important besides the ones in the shops or in the Pokemon centers. So you're actually kind of incentivized to talk to everyone to see for yourself if they are helpful or not. Anyway, moving on. Xenoblade 2 has an absolutely amazing soundtrack, I don't think anyone is going to really fight me on that, and the tracks really help to bring some cutscenes to life as well, although they <laughs> tend to reuse the same few tracks a lot, so they don't really go as hard as the first few times they use them. Oh yeah, the music! Whoa! This is so cool! Oh no! Rex! Pyra! Oh shit, what's gonna happen now? Oh, it's the same track. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still pretty good though. What? Another thing I don't think anyone will complain about is how the game looks. The art style and visual design of the open world is also extremely nice in my opinion. But while we're on the topic of the open world, I also just want to point out that the level designs of many JRPG overworlds tend to suffer from the similar problem of being mostly just an open field with enemies roaming around. It's not really a big deal to me, but I feel that in this area, western RPGs tend to do a lot better. Moving on to the side content of Xenoblade 2, the side quests in the game usually don't have very interesting narratives besides the blade quests, but the main gripe many people, including me, have with the side quests is that a lot of them end up somehow just turning into fetch quests. Like, hey, this quest just needs me to save this guy from a bunch of monkeys. Sounds good, right? Nope, now I gotta go find some confusion, Ivy. Which is like, okay, sure, like, I'll, find, I'll do that, like, right, fine, whatever. Okay, man, so I saved your son and collected his fucking plants for him. Can I have my reward now? Nope, but gotta go to this fucking no pond camp and buy some shit that costs 30,000 bucks, which I definitely do not have this early into the game. But oh wait, you know, he's making me another offer, which is to go out again 
and and look for fucking three mus muscle branches. Just leave me alone, man. What sucks the most about these for me is that most of the time it's kind of RNG dependent because the materials have a rarity system. So even if you go to the correct collection point, which by the way, you need to find in this giant map, you have to bank on the item you need actually dropping. People praise this game so much for the amount of content and hours you can spend on it, but almost every side feature this game offers just feels tacked on and shallow and uninteresting because the game barely puts any effort into making any of the extra shit it throws at the player fun. Even one of the most important side quests in the game to unlock Taurus Third Blade just boils down to running around the map to collect a bunch of shit at specific locations, you're just walking around and looking for a spot to press A or doing quick time events. Like I'd rather just have one side quest that's as good as the ones in The Witcher 3 or Yakuza 7 than all this boring and tedious shit that just feels like it's there to pad out the game and make it longer. There's a difference between actual content and padding, which is what I'm doing right now by saying a bunch of words with no substance just to make the video longer so I can prove a point. There are also some quest markers that are a bit wonky in my opinion. Like during this main quest in More Ardain, the game kind of just puts a quest marker in this corner of the map, which I didn't actually know you had to go down the stairs in the upper level to get to, so I ended up <laughs> unlocking this gate and running through a bunch of level 80 enemies on both my playthroughs, which <laughs> which wasn't very fun. The last thing I want to touch on is the whole mobile game gacha system that they chose to implement as the way you unlock blades. Normally this is already something I personally hate to see, especially in a game that I already paid $60 for, but it really really sucks that Xenoblade 2 chose to do this instead of just letting you unlock blades manually. On the off chance you've been watching this video without sound on the entire time, although I guess you wouldn't turn it on now because you can't hear me, I'll just reiterate that I really like the build creation and all the different options the game offers you to customize every party member, but by locking blades behind this gacha system, not only do you have to rely on luck to actually get a blade that is worth using, you also have very little control over the kind of blade each character gets. Like for example, if you want Morag to be a healer, then you have to pray that the game actually gives you a good blade that has healing capabilities. And as a result, this can lead to the player being forced to make do with what the game decides to give them, instead of having the freedom to just, you know, build their characters the way they want to build them in a $60 JRPG. Like, what's the point of even having this gacha system? There aren't even any in-game purchases, they don't earn money from it. I don't know man, maybe I'm just crazy, but I really hate seeing this shit creep into mainstream games. In the end, I feel that a big reason why I found Xenoblade 2 so underwhelming is because it doesn't really do that much to deviate from the standard JRPG formula of go on an adventure around the entire map and then kill God at the end, which isn't exactly necessary. I mean, Dragon Quest XI kind of does the same shit, although its story has much more interesting twists and events in my opinion. And I fucking love that game. But unlike, say, Persona games which had their interesting and unique mix of social simulation and dungeon crawling gameplay, or a game like Nier that has an extremely gripping story, or games like Dark Souls and Bloodborne which have extremely satisfying combat systems that they can fall back onto to provide the player with pretty much endless enjoyment, Nothing in Xenoblade 2 really stood out to me as amazing or groundbreaking, and because of the many flaws I just spent like a million years talking about, it was hard for me not to feel bored or frustrated during many parts of the game, which in turn kinda just brought down my overall enjoyment. I think that the reason why I have so many problems with Xenoblade 2 might also be because I personally had very high hopes and expectations due to the initial hype surrounding the game, but for most of the time I spent playing the game, I also honestly felt like I had already played many other games that do the same things it tries to do, but are better at doing them. Because I know deep down inside that if not for Xenoblade 1 being such a well-liked classic, this game would have gotten so much more criticism. I suppose I really wanted a game that would be on the same level as the two powerhouse titles that quite literally sold the Switch for Nintendo, but in hindsight it was also probably unreasonable for me to expect so much considering how fucking good these two games are. This all doesn't necessarily mean that Xenoblade 2 is a bad game, in fact it's probably still one of the better JRPGs out there, but I personally feel quite strongly that it really isn't the paragon that a lot of people seem to think it is.
If you are somehow listening to this, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to watch my video. Making this shit took weeks with all the editing and playing through the game again and I was constantly rewriting and changing the script to make sure I could convey my thoughts properly. I really want to thank my friends Nick and Marmar for helping me with various parts of this video. This would not have been possible without both of them. Even if you didn't agree with a single thing I said in this video, I hope that you at least found it entertaining or took something away from it and if you didn't, then I still really appreciate you staying all the way till the end. I'm probably gonna try to make more video essays like this on my channel now that I've kind of figured out what kind of content I want to make. I'll still upload random shit from time to time, but if you're interested in more videos like this one, then, you know, <laughs> go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Once again, thank you for watching my video. Until we see each other again.